sight, no gracious words we hear of him who spoke as none e'er spoke, yet we believe him. Rock of faith and vault of grace 
Yo! 
Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in Christ, good morning and welcome to worship. Today is Sunday, August the 23rd. It's the 12th Sunday of the season of Pentecost. Today we gather in the gift of God's Word. It is rich, as always. We'll first hear from the prophet Isaiah as we hear words that remind us that God is always with us. A wonderful psalm of praise is followed by the second reading in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is that chapter that so often reminds us that we live in response to what Jesus Christ has done for us. But the focus of our message time today comes to Matthew, the 16th chapter. It's a very important, crucial moment in the ministry of Jesus. He's in and around the region of the Roman city, Caesarea Philippi, and it's there that he asks that all-important question, a question that has infinite answers, a question that we hear in all three of the synoptic Gospels. He first asks, well, who do people say that I am or the Son of Man is? There's some answers. But then he turns it back to us and gives us the opportunity to, re to receive this wonderful question. But who do you say that I am? We gather and live in that question, never fully answering it, but always knowing its rich gift for us. So come forward. Let's head into worship now, as indeed we live in that answer again and again, as we hear Jesus ask, but who do you say that I am? We confess our sin and know always the good news of forgiveness that's ours in Christ Jesus that comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others. As you have welcomed us, we sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, and our sins are forgiven. Let us live in new hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
we pray together the prayer of the day. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 51. Just as God had called Abraham and Sarah and given them many descendants, so now God offers comfort to Zion. God's deliverance will come soon and will never end. Isaiah 51 Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden. Her desert like the garden of the Lord, joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Psalm 138 I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is such an important chapter in Paul's writings because it gives us the opportunity to respond to what's been given to us in Christ Jesus. So in response to God's merciful activity, we are to worship by living holistic, God-pleasing lives. Our values and viewpoints are not molded by the time in which we live, but are transformed by the Spirit's renewing work. 
God's grace empowers different forms of service among Christians. But all forms of ministry function to build up the body of Christ. Romans chapter 12 I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Today for our youth message, I would like to introduce this book, written and organized by Nobel Prize winner Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Bishop Tutu was instrumental in bringing forgiveness and peace to post-apartheid South Africa. And in this wonderful Bible, he brings insight of interpretation to tell stories for children. I would suggest between four and nine years old, I know our Denver children, especially our five-year-old granddaughter, loves this book. It's amazing what she can recite and tell. The book is in print, as you see before you, but it also comes with an audio version that our granddaughter listens to again and again, and she quotes this book. She quotes Bible stories to us in our family gatherings. So today, then, I want to share a story from the prophet. So boys and girls, today we hear from the prophet Isaiah in our worship, as you just heard in scripture. Today I want to share with you a story that tells us about that prophet, Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 1. The story is entitled, Isaiah Becomes God's Messenger. I'll show you the pictures first. There we are. There we go. All right, let's... Take a listen to this wonderful story, and I'll show you the pictures again at the end. Isaiah becomes God's messenger. One day, while Isaiah was praying in the temple, he had a vision of God sitting on a high throne surrounded by angels singing, Holy, 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 God is all-powerful and holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Isaiah thought about how unholy the people had become and how they had stopped trusting God. He thought about all the ways the rich were mean and cruel to the poor. Then he remembered all the times he had said hurtful things to others. Suddenly, Isaiah was afraid, for he knew he was not worthy to be in God's presence. I am lost, for my lips are unclean, Isaiah said. An angel touched a burning coal to Isaiah's lips. You are forgiven, the angel said. Then God said, Whom can I send to be my messenger? Isaiah answered, Here I am, Lord. Send me. And God said, 
Tell my people, if you want to speak to me, come and I will listen. I will wash away your sins and your hearts will be as white as snow. If you want to be my people, you must be holy. How is one holy? By doing good, seeking what is fair, rescuing the oppressed, and caring for the widow and the orphan. Here again is the story of the pictures. You can see the angel coming to the prophet Isaiah and the buildings of Isaiah's time as Isaiah receives a call to be God's prophet. So once again, uh, grandpas and grandmas, more of the kids might be at our parking lot worship, but this book is available in a lot of different places. We've got our copies on Amazon. Uh, it is a valuable gift, a wonderful gift for a child. So grandpa and grandma, think about it. Just check it. Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu, Children of God, Storybook Bible. Thank you. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And together we sing the Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? The Gospel is from Matthew, the 16th chapter. This particular passage is a climactic point in Jesus' ministry. God reveals to Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds with the promise of a church that will overcome the very gates of Hades. And this passage contains one of my favorite questions. It is a question, the ultimate question that is infinite for us. Our answer is not as important as the fact that Jesus asked the very question. So today, once again, we hear as we do every year, Jesus asks, But who do you say that I am? The Holy Gospel from Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, the one who asks us today, but who do you say that I am? 
what's the most important question that you've ever answered? What kind of commitment did it call you to make? Was it a lifetime promise? Many of us remember the day of our confirmation, that day when we went up before the entire congregation, a little nervous, I suspect, and made a promise to fulfill out the gift of our baptism and to live in that promise. Or perhaps you might remember a wedding day. That day you were asked that very important question. You may have been so nervous you didn't even know quite what to say. So do you? I, I, I do, do you? I, yeah, I, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Or perhaps you've joined the U.S. military. And an all-important question, an oath, a promise that you made in that to protect and to serve. Or perhaps you've had that moment where you brought your child up to the font. And, and you were there, and you were asked that important question, do you promise to fulfill these obligations? And, and well, here you are, yes. For me, besides the gift of family, marriage, and baptismal promises for them, I, for me, uh, just a week or so ago, on August 14th, the anniversary of my ordination, an important day of answering questions. So today, we come to this question. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am. Now for us Lutherans, we know that context is everything, right? So right away from the beginning, we have a little instruction in this passage about context. Jesus was asking this question in the district in the region around the city of Caesarea Philippi. What's that? Well, that was a prominent city in the northern part that was named after Roman authority that reminded the people of God in Christ the Jews, that uh, also that, that Caesarea Philippi, that they were an occupied place, that that political system was an imposter serving as the political system, and they suffered around it. I think it was no mistake that Jesus asked these questions so near to that city. Well, who do people say that the Son of Man is? People, what do you, what do you think? And so in that political reality, which was no reality, they began to give answers about the only reality. Well, some would say that um, you were John the Baptist, which would have been a compliment, I suppose, because he was a very important religious figure. But remember, he was executed by the false political system of the wicked King Herod. Others say, Jesus, that you are Elijah returned, and Elijah, a very important prophet of God who also struggled in life, and still others say of you, uh, Lord, that you are Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Jeremiah is one of my favorite because of the wild way that he brought words of prophecy, and he too died in a challenging way. All good answers. And do you suppose, do you suppose they knew it was coming? I, I mean, what a surprise. He turns it around from, hey, what are people saying around about? What do they think about me? To the pinpoint question, but you, you. Who do you say that I am? And as you might have expected from what you might know about Simon Peter, he came quick with an answer, Well, Lord, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now that too is a contextually a powerful answer. You are the Messiah. That's the Hebrew word for the anointed one. Jesus, the Messiah. But we also use another word to say the same thing, but in the Greek context and in a Roman world, Jesus is also the Christ. Same word, context here, again back to political reality. Did you know that the Caesars, the emperors of Rome, described themselves with that word, Christ? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is delighted, right, with Peter's answer. Peter, you got it right. He's so excited, he can hardly control himself, it seems. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You got it right for once, right? Because we've kind of come to realize that, that Peter usually gets stuff wrong. But then not to let Peter get too big of a head, even in being right. And he said, you know, but Peter, flesh and blood didn't do this for you. You didn't think of this on your own. In fact, no, it came to you from the gift of the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Spirit moves us forward to say such things. But then Jesus gives him some pretty good marks. He says, hey, you are Peter. And on this rock, again, context, it was a play on words because Petros, or Peter, is the word rock. So it's the same rock, and when this time at least Peter's not a rock head. 
I will build my church on this. And the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. It's a powerful, powerful moment. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Among other things, I hear the power of forgiveness. It's one of the reasons that I introduced the book by Archbishop Desmond Mantutu. He was part of an incredible process, an architecture of forgiveness that happened in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the chairperson of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or as it's known, the TRC, which was created by the Nelson Mandela government to bring national unity when they came to the end of the evil racial system of apartheid. And that system, that TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was set up to go back and look into the violations that took place from 1960 to 1994 to provide support and reparation for the victims and their families and to bring a full report of what effect apartheid had had on South African society. Now, it was a pretty amazing moment because what happened in so many cases is they brought victims and they brought the the persons that, that brought these heinous crimes against the victims, they brought perpetrators and victims into the same room, they sat them down, the stories were told, the violations were named, and then the victim was asked to forgive. Wait, for, forgive? How, how, how could that be? But Nelson Mandela knew, as does Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that Forgiveness is a powerful thing, and he says this about, Tutu says this about forgiveness. When I talk of it, I mean the belief that you can come out on the other side a better person. A better person than the one being consumed by the anger and the hatred. Because remaining in that state locks you into the state of being a victim. Victimhood. Making you almost dependent then on the perpetrator. But if you are called to forgive, if you can find a place to forgive, you're no longer chained to that perpetrator. And not only that, you might be able to help the perpetrator. That was one of the, the great gifts of the truth and reconciliation process overseen by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Let's keep going by going back to the all-important question today. Well, I'm not going to give you my answer because I'm working on it all the time, always trying to understand a better answer but I want to say this. So often, my answer almost always begins in the particular. I think about what Christ has done for me, overpowered the place of death and life, given new life to me, promised a new creation, a resurrection, to be together with all of God's people, with family and friend, and but most important, to the very presence of Christ himself in this new heaven and new earth. That's amazing. That's for me. But then at that very moment, as soon as I've said that, then I realize that I'm called also to recognize that Christ is the universal Christ for all time and for all of creation. Let's just say for all of the universe and beyond, if there is such a thing. So I think every person has that opportunity to know that this Christ is in the particular for them, but also calls them to live in the universal reality of that love for all. So living the answer is maybe one of the best ways of answering it. And one of the gifts that we pastors have is that we see oftentimes from day to day how people live and answer that question, but who do you say that I am? It's been a busy week this week of caring for members, funerals, new health concerns. And so today, today just a couple of those that I think bring the answer. The first happened in the funeral of one of our members. She was 101 years old. One of my first memories of her took place just a couple years ago now that uh, we went to sing Christmas carols to her house and this 100-year-old, about 100-year-old woman immediately connected to one of our three-year-olds. And a bond was made there that was only, obviously, Christ, singing of Christ's birth. This lady was special. Her caretaker says that she would not talk negative about others. She didn't complain. And she went on to explain that every night 
As the caretaker left her room as she readied for sleep, she could hear this childlike prayer, this conversation of sorts, that went on something like, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go, um, and, I, and, and I really miss my husband. I, I really like to go. To live as Christ, to die as gain, Paul says. You see, for me, her life, all 101 years, is the answer to the question, but who do you say that I am? Death came near to another family in our congregation, to one of our members lost a younger brother. How challenging that must be. And yet that younger brother had cancer about a year and, uh, and our member knew that it was better that he was no longer suffering. And such faith that is ready to let go for the sake of what Christ will do, that too is the answer to the question, but who do you say that I am? Also, a number of members have been facing health challenges this week. One of our members faces a very challenging sudden diagnosis. And in that, yet, fear of course, but yet, Faith to say, uh, Pastor, I, I want those folks to pray for me in that prayer group, in the FELC prayer group. I need those prayers moving forward. And so we stopped right there. When we finished, uh, pray we prayed, praying for this person and their family, praying for the reality of a medical team and giving them wisdom and insight to deal with this challenging situation. And see, see dear friends in Christ, that is the answer coming from that member. That is the answer to the question, who do you say that I am? And the last answer for today actually came first, just minutes after we'd finished last week's parking lot service. I wasn't expecting it. I have to admit, I'm not even sure I knew what the passage was for the next sermon. And a member came up to me and gave me then what I didn't realize was the answer, but is the answer. The member came up to me and said, yeah, I've been reading uh, Bonhoeffer this week, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. See, he's the kind of guy that if you, if you mention a book in a sermon, he goes out and buys it and reads it. No formal education, theology, ethics, or anything like that, but he just buys the books and reads them. And then comes back and wants to talk to me about them, and often he knows more about the books than I do. <laughs> so he announced that he was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer's classic, The Cost of Discipleship the storyline that says when Christ calls someone, a man, he bids them to come and die. And throughout the book, Bonhoeffer keeps asking, what is the cost of discipleship? What does that mean? If you don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during World War II. He stood up against the Nazis and took part in an assassination plot to kill Hitler, and then he was executed for his place in that, just weeks before the war was over. And he is a true theologian of the cross who knows about the cost of discipleship. So there on the parking lot, not intending to, our member preached a sermon to his pastor in just a matter of a minute or two, answering the question, what is the cost of discipleship? Answering the question that I had not yet even thought about, who do you say that I am? The answer then given by our member, puts it in such simple terms, it's so easy, and yet it would take a lifetime and beyond to live it out. His answer to what is the cost of discipleship is also the answer to who do you say that I am. The answer is that you, Lord Jesus, you, Lord Jesus Christ, you, Lord Jesus, the Messiah, are everything. Everything. Amen.
Christ be praised. Alike at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ be praised. To Thee, my God above, I cry with glowing love. May Jesus Christ be graces spring in hearts that ever sing. May Jesus Christ be praised. Does sadness fill my mind? A soulless ear I find. May Jesus Christ be praised. Or fades my earthly bliss, my comfort still is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. When evil thoughts Christ be praised, the powers of darkness fear, when this sweet chant they hear, may Jesus Christ be praised. When sleep her balm denies, my silent spirit sighs, Jesus Christ be praised, the night becomes as day, when from the heart we say, may Jesus Christ be praised. Be this while life is mine, my canticle Today we make our statement of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here, at home, and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries. 
legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purpose in the governance of peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved in trouble or adversity or sick and in need of care. And Lord, our prayers for this world continue and for this nation, for all those who have known the challenges of COVID-19, the loss of employment, the loss of economic structure. We pray for those who suffer in these days. We pray for those who suffer and lost health and who, lo who have lost the basic necessities of life. And we pray, of course, for all who suffer the loss of loved ones to this terrible disease. Encourage us, Lord, to be steadfast in who we are in combating this virus. And so, Lord, hear us as we also pray for many here in our midst. We pray today for Haley, for Bruce, for Terry, for Doris, for Lena, for Jody, for Brian and Ben. We pray for Lana, for Pat, Heidi, Donna, Jimmy, Todd, and Norm. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for family and friends of Jay Jensen, of Lorraine Branting, of Don Shahan, of Don Dinger. We pray for family and friends of Leona Duvall and Christy Fisher. Here are our prayers for family and friends of Dr. Jean Harbuck, of Eva Retzel, of George McCammon, of Jean Olson, of Chris Rankin. Here are our prayers for family and friends of Mary Ann Jorgensen, Al Kempke, and Franklin Carland. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into this community in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy, people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. 
Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. May I be like you. We pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Beloved in Christ, we have been given the peace of Christ in the waters of baptism, in the power of the word. We are thankful for that presence. And so, the Christ who gives us such peace invites us to share it carefully with one another. And so in these days of digital technology, we attempt to share the peace in that way as we wait to be back together. So I invite you then in the comment section on Facebook, through a text message, a phone call, share that peace with one another. Share just that, that loving gift that is the mercy and grace to be with you in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. Again today we gather in the gift of the offering. It is God's opportunity for us to bring gratitude to our hearts. The truth is the gift of an offering for the work of Christ's action around the world is a point of gratitude. And we understand more and more that if we're filled with gratitude, our entire life lives in a healthy way. So today we again give you that opportunity, thankful for abundant gifts, but always knowing that the church must go on with its work, and so it does. And so your gifts are used around the world in the confidence that it's shared in the gift of Christ. We thank you for that, and in the symbol of this wonderful offering plate, we remind you, please, to send your offerings to the church and through the envelope that's provided both with your 
envelope system and the envelopes that you find in the newsletters. We appreciate very much your support and we continue to bring wonderful ministry in the way of Christ. These plates are the wonderful symbol of that truth. Receive this opportunity to know the gift of life in Christ, the power of the gift of giving your offering. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. And receive the final blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that gift. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.